Okay, let's continue on. We just finished through the entire chapter 22, the last chapter of Revelation. So let's kind of summarize this and reflect on uh, not only this chapter, but Revelation in general. So what can we say about Revelation? Well, for starters, Revelation is the culmination and fulfillment of all the law, of the covenants that God made with his people and with all the prophets by Jesus, by Jesus Christ. He came to earth, remember, to fulfill the law and prophets, not to abolish it. Revelation also highlights the deity of Jesus Christ. If anyone is ever questions, is Jesus Christ the Almighty God? Read Revelation. In particular, read chapters 1, the second half in particular, and chapters 4 and chapter 5. Uh, they will leave you in awe and wonder of our Lord, our Savior, our Messiah. Revelation helps us to understand true praise, true worship, and how God deserves our highest praise. I mean, we're seeing magnificent beings in constant, harmonious praise, and not just light praise, but pouring it all out uh, to our, our God and to our Lord and Savior. Um, Revelation addresses the problems not only among the early church, but the early church was really just representatives of the church as a whole to the universal church. And with these seven letters, there was what? There was very serious warning to what we see quite evident and prevalent in today's churches. And I, I would shudder to say or sad to say that quite often in the American church, the Western church, and that is a serious warning to the pseudo-believers, those that go to the church more for a social uh, uh, status and club than, uh, than really worshiping and learning and obeying God. And probably more important, the leaders of the church, very, very serious warning to the those leaders that are compromising, that will not confront evil, that will not call uh, evil, evil, uh, because they don't want to offend anybody in the church today. This is serious, folks, and it's more prevalent than uh, many probably think. Revelation calls repeatedly for obedience, for perseverance, and perseverance to the end even if it means life or death. Very, very important. And we will, once we do a quick review of chapter 7, we'll see once again how important. It emphasizes the importance of our deeds. Remember what Jesus said to all the seven churches, I know your deeds. So the question that we need to ask ourselves is, do we walk the talk? What do others see in us? So let's say if charges were levied against us and we were brought into the court of the law and the charge is, I allege that he's a Christian, the question would be, is there enough evidence that would overwhelmingly convince everyone that yes, we are a Christian. Yes, I put my faith and hope and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, I pursue holiness as opposed to pursuing the ways of the world, the lust of the flesh, calling uh, evil good and good evil. Revelation addresses also a huge importance of our own personal testimony and standing firm in Christ. That's what the whole armor of God is about. To what? To stand firm, that in the days of evil, to stand firm. And Paul says, I say again, stand firm. That is so important, what we say, what we portray, and then also if we're confronted and if we're given a choice, and especially if that choice is, is a life or death, stand firm. Stand firm in Christ. Don't be a coward. Remember, 
uh, our actions, our deeds, could very well have eternal consequences. Revelation emphasizes the importance of resisting the idolatry that's being offered uh, by the world, the lust of the flesh, uh, the sexual desires, uh, uh, greed, um, all the selfishness. It's all about me, not about God's kingdom or helping my fellow man or helping my brothers and sisters in Christ. Revelation also reminds us that eternal punishment, like it or not, is real, and it's punishment, and it's eternal, and it's not annihilation. Revelation reminds us that God judges everyone without exception. He, however, is just, and everyone will receive their judgment and their reward based on what they did here on earth. What our will is, is it for the world or is it for God? Also, Revelation helps us to understand what the gospel message is all about. Remember the gospel message? Uh, uh, the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, Jesus Christ said, I came to, to preach the coming uh, kingdom my kingdom, that's why I was sent here. Uh, this is so vitally, vitally important uh, that we know and understand what the gospel message really is because quite often I think it's, uh, it's twisted into a misunderstanding that, uh, uh, yeah, you die and you'll be up there in the spirit in heaven on clouds and playing harps and, and uh, life would be just like a... Um, a permanent church service, and that's not the case at all, which hopefully uh, chapters 20 and 21 helped us to understand. Okay, so one thing, so it's been a while. I want to do just a very quick summary and review of the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls and how it all fits into uh, the Revelation picture. So remember we started off with the seven seals where Jesus Christ was handed the scroll and then he started to tear off the seals. And he had to tear off seven seals before he could open the scroll. So the first seal was the white horse uh, where a conqueror uh, came out conquering and to conquer power was given to him. Uh, the fiery red horse, once again, power was given to him to take peace away from the earth. And he was given a great sword, remember? So where the white horse was a political uh, co means of conquering, the red horse was a military means of conquering. And then that was followed by the black horse. Remember, it had a pair of scales crying out a quart of wheat or three quarts of barley for a day's wages. So that will be famine uh, that will follow. And then there's the pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and in Death had Hades following. So Death was a physical death, Hades was a spiritual death. And they were given authority to kill over a fourth of the earth, which, by the way, about a fourth of the earth is all the, the Christians and the Jews that are found in the earth today. And then the fifth seal, when that was opened, the souls of those who had been slain were found under the altar, and they were crying out. Uh, first of all, they were slain because of their testimony, their testimony of Jesus, the testimony of following God, and they were asking for vengeance, but they were told what? To wait until more are killed as they themselves had been. What? You mean more of us must be killed before... The plan moves forward, and the answer was yes. And then the sixth seal. And I'll have to say, for me, the sixth seal is, is the biggest confusing seal of where this happens in the timeline and the scheme of things. But 
the sixth seal, there's a great earthquake. And then we got the cosmic events of the sun and moon and stars going black, the whole sky vanishing and rolling up like a scroll, and everybody running into caves and crevices saying, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne because they're seeing him. And from the wrath of the Lamb, they see him. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? And then the seventh seal, when that was torn, there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. And then seven angels marched up, and they were given trumpets. And we had another angel that took a censer that was filled with the prayer of the saints, and he hurls it down on earth, uh, <coughs> indicating to us that the prayers of the saints definitely had a role to play in all this. And then we saw the seven trumpets. Uh, the seven trumpets, the first trumpet, or actually, shall we say, the first four were against nat nature, uh, the natural uh, uh, domain, and the last ones were, were levied against mankind that uh, have chosen not to follow God. So the first trumpet, a third of the earth, the third of the trees were burned, all the green grass was burned, so that's a whole bunch of natural resources going up in smoke. The second trumpet, a third of the sea became blood, and a third of sea life was killed, and a third of the ships were destroyed as well, so there must have been tsunami waves. And then the third seal, a third of all fresh water became bitter, and many people died because of this bitter water. The fourth seal, a third of the sun and the moon and the stars were struck, and so a third of the light by day and by night was taken away. And then comes the fifth seal, and this starts the three woes. Uh, the fifth seal, there's all these locust-like creatures uh, uh, with scorpion-like stings that were released uh, from the bottomless uh, pit, millions and millions of them. And they tormented only those without the seal of God on their foreheads for five months, which tells us there was also those on earth that had the seal of their foreheads, of God on their foreheads. So this, uh, once again, shows us the Goshen principle that was uh, protecting God's people in the time of uh, Egypt and Exodus, once again, in play here during the fifth uh, trumpet. And then the sixth trumpet, there was four angels that were released uh, that had been bound for centuries in the, uh, at the Euphrates r River. And when they're released, they're instructed to kill a third of mankind. And then the seventh trumpet sounds, the last trumpet that's recorded in Revelation. And we are told that on the days of the sounding of the trumpet by the seventh angel, so it's more than a single day, uh, the mystery of God was going to be fulfilled. And there was proclamations in the heavenly courts that the, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and his Christ. So it has become, it has started, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the time now for the dead to be judged and for the rewarding, your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both great and or small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Okay, and also with the seventh trumpet, we have seven angels lining up with seven bowls. The seven bowls, the first one sends out harmful, painful sores on those who bore the mark of the beast and worship its in image. The second uh, was poured out and Every living creature in the sea dies. The third one is poured out, and all the rivers and springs of water turns to blood. The fourth one comes out, and the sun scorches people with fire. And so all this cumulative effect, there's utter misery, but yet it's recorded. They did not repent. They cursed God. The fifth one, the throne and kingdom of the Antichrist, the beast, is plunged into darkness, like the three days of darkness of Pharaoh and his people um, in the days of Exodus. And people gnaw their tongues in anguish. 
The six boulders then pour, and the Euphrates River dries up, and demons are released, going all over the world, performing signs and convincing the kings of the earth to come and gather and attack Jerusalem. <coughs> Excuse me. And they assemble at a place called Armageddon. The seventh seal is then poured out, and the largest earthquake ever recorded in the history of mankind occurs. And Jerusalem and other cities are split apart. Islands and mountains disappear. Hundred-pound hailstones fall on the people. And then we have the Battle of Armageddon. So, as you know, I have been shying away from possible timelines. I feel like timelines is, is not the reason and the purpose of Revelation, even though it's of high interest. It's not part of the key message. The key message is how does it apply to me? What do I do? What do I need to change in my life? Does it change the way uh, that I'm a testimony and a witness of Jesus Christ? That's the takeaways from Revelation. But nevertheless, I do want to share some timelines. And once again, these are possible timelines. Uh, there are definitely, there's plenty of wiggle room um, on how things happen, whether it's all linear or they stacked up or, or they staggered. Uh, but anyway, nevertheless, here's one I put together. <clears throat> so remember, uh, in Revelation chapter 5, the Lamb receives the scroll. Jesus Christ receives the scroll, and now he starts to, to uh, break away uh, the seals. Will receiving the scroll and breaking away the first seal, my, I firmly believe that this begins the 70th seven, the last week of Daniel's 77s. The first seal, uh, the white horse, uh, that would be the Antichrist coming on the scene. Nobody knows he's the Antichrist yet, but he's coming on the scene, and he's starting a political campaign focused on the Middle East. The second seal then is it shifts from a political campaign to a military campaign. Remember all that we read about in Daniel and all the military uh, clashes, uh, uh, especially with Egypt, but other uh, neighboring Middle East con uh, countries as well, and then the occupation in um, Israel. Uh, and all that results in the third seal being broken, which is which is what? Famine. All of a sudden now, we're, we're losing crops, uh, we're losing supply lines, and this is going to set the stage for the Antichrist to then put in his policy of, if you don't accept the mark of the beast and worship the image of the beast, no food for you, no water for you, no shelter for you. And then in the midst of all this is the abomination of desolation where the Antichrist takes away the temple sacrifice. He himself occupies the Holy of Holies in the third temple of Jerusalem. That is the abomination of desolation spoken of by Jesus Christ. And that would immediately result in the fourth seal being broken where the fourth horseman, the, the pale horse uh, of death in Hades that we just talked about, uh, death being physical, Hades being if you, uh, be the holding area of those that will be eternally damned, uh, but also in this context, the holding area for those that reject Christ and accept the Antichrist and the mark of the beast and worship him. The fifth seal, the martyrs that we just talked about that were below the throne, the altar, correction, the altar, and they were the souls of the martyrs uh, so they were, they had not had resurrected bodies yet, which means the resurrection and rapture had not happened yet. The sixth seal, the sun, moon, and stars. Uh, and then after the sixth seal, the sun, moon, and stars, we have chapter seven, where 144,000 were sealed. We also have these multitudes, multitudes before the throne of every tongue and tribe and language of the world. And they're praising God. And it's evident they have bodies. And because they have bodies, then that is seen as uh, where the resurrection and the rapture occurs uh, according to the pre-wrath theory. Um, and it's a very, they have some very, very strong arguments and all that. Then there's the, the seventh uh, seal. The seventh seal is the, is the half hour of silence. And the seven angels come up and they start their uh, series of blowing the trumpets. And so 
We have uh, the first four trumpets uh, that uh, attack nature. The fifth attacks mankind for five months. That's the reason why there's a little space between trumpet five and six. And then the sixth trumpet uh, and the seventh trumpet is the last trumpet. So uh, at the sound of the last trumpet, if that's the last trumpet spoken of by the Apostle Paul, then that's what he teaches is what then occurs as the resurrection and the rapture of the saints. So that would be uh, where the post-tribulation crowd will put the rapture. But then after the seventh trumpet, we have seven angels with seven bowls, and now it's no more punishment or chastisement, it is now the wrath of God being poured out on the earth, on the unrepentant people that's going to enter into utter destruction of both the unrepentant and uh, the burning away of the old heaven and earth with the new heaven and earth coming later. So after the seven bowls, we got the Battle of Armageddon, the Antichrist, uh, destroys Babylon the Great in all this uh, because he had been enticed by God himself to destroy Babylon the Great and remember what that was uh, and then, or who that was. And then the Antichrist and the false prophet because they're now destroyed and, and, the, and the, the Antichrist uh, army is, is slaughtered. The Antichrist and false prophet are caught are brought to a quick judgment uh, and are thrown into the lake of fire. And then we got Satan bound for a thousand years, the millennial kingdom, Satan is released. And, um, and then the last battle in front of uh, the, the, uh, the old Jerusalem and, um, and then Satan and all Satan is thrown into the lake of fire and then we have the second, uh, the resurrection of those before the great white throne judgment and the second death. Now, that last half, uh, that 1260 days, that 42 months, that time times and half a time, uh, three and a half years, uh, the time of great tribulation and, and Jacob's trouble. Well, let's expand on that just a little bit. And, and we will do that first by going back to Daniel. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, where it says, He shall speak words against the Most High. So this is going to be uh, uh, the Antichrist being uh, possessed by Satan and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. So that will be uh, the Jacob's trouble, or more importantly, probably the Great Tribulation, and shall think to change the times and the law. Well, if you want to know about that, go back to that teaching. And they shall be given into his hand. So the Antichrist, will, the people of God, will be given to the Antichrist for how long? A time, times, and half a time. So as you see in that graph here, the last three and a half years, they shall be given into his hand. Um, and verse 25, his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end at Armageddon. Daniel 9, 13 and 14, for how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate and the giving over the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And the answer given here by the angel is for 2,300 evenings and mornings or uh, that would be uh, uh, 1,150 days of evenings and mornings. And then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. So here on the graph, we got where the regular burnt offerings of the temple sacrifices, uh, they're begin, they begin. Uh, then there's the abomination of desolation, or in the words of Daniel here, transgression that makes desolate. And then what? the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot, which we'll read later in Revelation for 42 months. Um, And then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state after Jesus' second coming. 
A few verses later, 9.27, now we're in the 77s, and uh, he shall make a strong covenant, he being the Antichrist, the beast, with many for a week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decree end is poured out on the desolator, the Antichrist. And the, we spent a full session. Actually, we spent two full sessions on Daniel, but uh, at least a half a session just on this passage in Daniel chapter 9. So he will make a strong covenant with leaders for a week. So that's the full seven years. Uh, but in the middle of the seven, he will, what, put an end to sacrifice and offering and the temple is set up an abomination that causes desolation. This is the abomination of desolation that Jesus spoke about in the Olivet Discourse. So, and what did he say? When you see the abomination of desolation, let the, let the reader understand. And also he says, run, run. Don't even get your stuff, run. And so there's three and a half years until the decreed in is poured out on the desolator, which once again is the uh, seventh uh, bowl and the battle of Armageddon and the great white throne judgment. <clears throat> the last chapter of Daniel, Daniel 12, uh, and the first seven verses, we read about there's going to be a time of trouble such as never been. That's going to be the great tribulation and Jacob's trouble. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. And what we found out later is that's just a remnant that's going to be delivered, a third uh, that we read about in Zechariah. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. So this is the resurrection, the first mention in the Old Testament. Some to everlasting life. So, uh, so there's resurrection. There's going to be some to everlasting life. And uh, there's going to be those uh, who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And then the question is asked, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And the angel responds, it will be for a time, times, and half a time, or three and a half years. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people, now who's that? That's the Jewish people, comes to an end. That's Jacob's trouble. When all that comes to an end, then all these things would be finished. Okay, so let's look also uh, at similar timeline in Revelation. Uh, three and a half years, 1260 days, 42 months, time, times, and half a time. Uh, Revelation 11, verse 2 where John is instructed, what? Do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out. For why? It's given over to the nations. And they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And the very next verse. And then I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days or 42 months. It's all the same. And they're going to be clothed in sackcloth. And we talked about that in a, in a special session. And and then in chapter 12, verse 6, we had the woman that was fled, that fled into the wilderness because the, the, uh, the serpent uh, uh, was, uh, was chasing her. And uh, it says what? Where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. And then later in verse 14, the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. And then also in verse 5, and the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. So uh, you have all this occurring in the last three and a half years um, after the abomination of desolation, as uh, Jesus talked about, and uh, Daniel. So I'm going to end there with, Come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha. That should be the cry of our hearts. If we're not eagerly 
looking forward to the day of Jesus coming, then we probably should look at ourselves internally and see where our priorities are in life. Because our priority in life should be the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. We look forward to that day. So on that note, Maranatha.